All right. Assalamu alaikum. So, welcome to the third lecture of uh, our course on uh, life as you may have never seen before. Uh, so far, we've uh, looked at the basics of uh, blood flow. We've come up with uh, a simple argument on uh, the Ohm's law analog to blood flow. And we've seen that when blood flows through the circulatory system, there is uh, a pressure drop that is required. And that pressure drop arises out of vascular resistance, the resistance of the network of arteries, arterioles, capillaries, veins, and so on. Uh, we are preparing a homework, which will actually give you some practice on calculating pressure differences, resistances, what happens when a particular artery branches off into arterioles, and those arterioles then branch off into a network of capillaries, what kind of resistance does such a branched network uh, offer? Uh, so, so now I would, today I would rather like to uh, give a big overview of uh, the variation of pressures and blood flows inside the circulatory system. So we've looked at the small microscopic bits, the physical principles of pressure, uh, the hagen poiseuille's law, which describes blood flow. Uh, and now we're going to take a zoom out view and look at the heart, the circulatory system as a whole. Uh, and we're going to see how pressure varies, how the heart can be modeled. The heart can really be modeled like an engine. So we, we're going to motivate ourselves about this analogy between the heart uh, and a mechanical engine. And don't consider me a heartless being who's just equating a heart with uh, an engine, an automobile engine. But the physical uh, analogy is very stark here. So I would like to resort to uh, a few slides uh, to bring home this idea in, in, in a better fashion. <clears throat> All right, so the big view of pressures and volumes inside the circulatory system. Of course, we're focusing on the human circulatory system. All right. So nothing can be complete without understanding the anatomy of the heart, the structure of the heart. So I'm not an anatomist or, or a doctor, but understanding the heart is crucial to understanding how pressures and volumes work inside the circulatory system and the heart especially. So if you look at the heart over here, it has four chambers. We all know that. Uh, this is the left atrium, the right atrium, uh, and below these atria are the ventricles, four chambers in all, and blood flows in. So let's look at the big view first. So here is our heart, and supplementary to the heart, there are two networks of vessels. One is a pulmonary circuit, which pushes blood through the lungs and brings back blood from the lungs into the heart. And the other is a systemic circuit. All the rest lies in the systemic circuit. So what's happening is that, let's start from here. So these are capillaries. These capillaries join together to form uh, the veins. These veins then bring deoxygenated blood back into the right atrium. Blood from the right atrium goes into the right ventricle. So still this is deoxygenated blood in want of oxygen. The heart pumps this uh, bolus of blood into the lungs where it comes into contact with the alveolar ducts and gaseous exchange takes place. Oxygen is brought into the blood. It attaches with the hemoglobin, which is oxidized. This oxygenated blood that goes back into the heart through another vein, anything that brings blood back into the heart is a vein. So this is the pulmonary vein. The pulmonary vein now makes its entry into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it goes down into the left ventricle. The heart pumps and this oxygenated blood then flows out of the aorta, the biggest artery and all of its branches into the systemic network. 
and here oxygen exchange again takes place the blood loses on its oxygen and the deoxygenated blood comes back to the heart so this is the big uh, structure of the circulatory system in a, a which is amenable to making a model out of it okay so this is not an anatomical picture this is rather a conceptual picture of the circulatory system now if you look at the heart closely so there's a left part and the right part and both of them really work in tandem they work together so these are the pulmonary veins that are bringing in this oxygenated blood into the left atrium there is no valve here blood can just come into the left atrium but in between the left atrium and the left ventricle there is an atrioventricular valve the mitral valve when this chamber fills up with blood the pressure goes up the volume of blood in here goes up the pressure goes up it pushes down onto this valve which opens up and when it opens up blood flows right into the left ventricle all right remember blood flows from one chamber to another whenever there is a pressure gradient so when the pressure gradient is large enough that this valve opens blood flows into the left ventricle and when the pressure goes up here it opens up this aortic valve and blood can just gush out of the aorta and go into the systemic circulatory system that's the big uh, big view likewise on the right hand side blood from the rest of the body is coming through these vena cavi uh, there's a superior and an inferior vena cavi they both open up and empty blood into the right atrium and again there's an atrioventricular valve called the tricuspid valve in between the atrium and the ventricle and this blood can flow into the right ventricle uh, when this valve is opened up and when the pressure goes up here blood can gush out of the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery and go into the lungs now this the structure of this heart is fine tuned it, it appears for all of these functions remember that the heart is pumping at around 60 70 or 80 beats per minute so in a lifetime it would have pumped millions of times and the, the muscular structure of the heart the size of the walls the kind of muscle filaments that are inside the walls and make up the segment walls they are fine tuned to this function so there is a very strong correlation between structure and function like any other device that we build the structure has to be commensurate with the function you can't expect an object to perform a certain function but the structure is not built for that so there is a strong interrelationship between the anatomy and the physiology between the structure and the function and these valves are also special the two valves that are in between the atria and the ventricles the mitral and the tricuspid valves they are of a different kind uh, they open up like flaps uh, and these valves that are the <clears throat> valves that go into the aorta and to the pulmonary artery they are of a different kind they have different elastic properties these valves snap open and snap down in a in a very rapid movement whereas the atrioventricular valves they are slower and sluggish so any questions about this overall structure yes please it it can open so the, so there are pathologies that lead to regurgitation of blood back into where it doesn't belong so there could be pathologies the probability is never zero all right so so these minute uh, digressions or changes from normal behavior show up in a normal heart as well but cardiomyopathies or diseases of the heart can lead to exacerbations of uh, deviation from normal behavior okay any more questions about this so so we can move on to the physics and the biomechanics of this all right so 
All right. So in thermodynamics, we have state variables. So if you study heat and thermodynamics, uh, for example, you study gases or fluids, you need to know what the pressure is and what the volume is. All right. So pressure and volume make up a pair of state variables. Right. So you studied Boyle's law, there's a pressure, volume, and then there could be a temperature as well. Pressure and volume are state variables. Other state variables could be entropy and temperature. So when we are looking at the biomechanics of the heart, we are really looking at pressures and volumes. And we don't have an ideal gas here, let alone a gas. We, we have a fluid here, a highly viscous fluid, blood, uh, which whose properties depend upon the amount of cells inside the blood, the hemotricid. And what we would now like to analyze is the temporal variation of pressures and volumes inside the heart. And this produces a pulse that goes all out in the body. So let's look at the heart first. So what we're looking at in this graph is the temporal variation. We're looking at just the heart and looking at how pressure and volume inside the different chambers of the heart varies in time okay and when i say volume it means the volume of blood all right so there are different curves here so let's first focus on uh, let's start our discussion from this point now overall the cardiac cycle as this is called can be broken up into two parts one is the diastole and the other is the systole. The diastole is the relaxation of the heart. When the heart relaxes, it expands and it allows blood to come in. And when the heart compresses or contracts, the muscles contract, blood gushes out. That's the systolic part. Okay, so there is a part of periodic dilation heart expanding, blood coming in, relaxation, and then contraction in which the blood goes out. And these parts are technically called the systole and the diastole. Now here what happens is, let's see what happens. Let's focus our attention here. At this point, the atrioventricular valve opens, which is the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And similarly, there is a valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle. All right. And in this diagram, we're only focusing on the left part of the heart. We don't, we're not plotting the right part, right? If you want to look at the right part, you just take all of these pressures and you, you'll get a similar graph for the right part with pressures that are lowered by, by about one sixth. Okay, so we're just focusing on the left part. Now here the atrioventricular valve opens, which means this valve opens. And if, and when this opens, blood can come into the left ventricle. Okay, so here is the blood gushing into the left ventricle, coming into the left ventricle. Okay, so this blue curve represents the volume of blood that is coming into the ventricle, it's going up because blood is now flowing into the left ventricle. At this point, the uh, aortic valve is closed by the way, right? So this valve is closed, this valve is closed. This valve opens up because the pressure of blood in the left atrium has gone up it opens this valve, blood comes into the left ventricle and the volume of blood in the left ventricle goes up, goes up, goes up. So it, there's a ra rapid inflow ingress of blood in the first one third part. Then the flow of blood into the left ventricle slows down a little bit. And then what, what happens is the, if you look at this dashed curve, this dashed curve, can you see the dashed curve here? 
so far the atrium is also in a relaxed state but the atrium also has to contract when the atrium contracts you get a bump in the atrial pressure right so there's a bump here when the atrial pressure goes up a little bit in other words the atrium contracts this valve is still open this valve is still closed it gives another injection of blood into the ventricle and this represents this additional hump of blood flowing into the ventricle this by the way this atrial contraction is triggered by an electrical signal which is called the p wave of an ecg we'll we'll discuss electrical signals later but this is triggered by this p wave in the ecg uh, there are muscles there is an action potential that is traveling inside the heart which is causing this atrium to contract and when the atrium contracts there is an additional ingress of blood into the ventricle so if you look at the blood volume inside the ventricle it's going up in the diastole the heart is still in a relaxed state it's going up first the ingress is rapid then you get a steady slow ingress the state called diastasis and then the atrial systole happens the atrial contraction takes place and you get an additional uh, flow of blood into the ventricle so even before the atrial contraction about 80% of the blood that the ventricles can hold has already gotten into the ventricle and if there is some problem with atrial contraction there is some myopathy some disease it's hard to detect so atrial uh, diseases are harder to detect than ventricular diseases because the ventricle is still getting 80% of the blood that it that is required all right so so this so this dashed curve is the atrial pressure and uh, of course the of course this red curve here this big red curve is the ventricular pressure so blood is flowing in the heart is in a relaxed state blood is coming in the volume is going up but the pressure is not is not changing much all right now what's going to happen at this point at this particular point so i'm just going to move from here to here this is the, these are the same points because these points are labeled at this point the this valve the atrioventricular valve closes and this aortic valve is still closed all right now what this means is that blood cannot come in to the ventricle and it cannot go out so the volume of blood remains constant so that's represented by this plateauing of this plateauing of here however so this is a isovolumetric phase the volume is of blood is not going up whatever blood has come into the ventricle it stays there because this inlet gate has closed this outlet gate is already closed so the volume remains constant but now all of this blood suddenly increases the pressure in the ventricle right so this pressure goes up right it goes up how here it's going up so in this small region the volume does not change but the pressure goes up the ventricular pressure goes up now just before this region in the ecg the action potential has now traveled to the ventricle and the muscle of the ventricle starts to contract big contraction this is called the qrs complex of an ecg now when the qrs complex of the ecg takes place it orders it signals the ventricular muscles to contract and the ventricular ventricular muscles contract and when the pressure goes so high the pressure is going up 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 when it reaches this point or this point the pressure is so high and beyond the a pressure in the aorta this dashed curve represents the pressure in the aorta when the two curves meet the ventricular pressure is trying to nudge higher than the aortic pressure it opens up this aortic valve tak avazati 
ठीक है when when this aortic valve opens the ventricular pressure is still going up and the aortic pressure the pressure in this big vessel also goes up all right but in the meantime a t wave happens an action potential uh, results in another depolarization repolarization the t wave happens and it orders the ventricles to relax when the ventricles start relaxing the pressure in the ventricles go, goes down the aortic pressure also goes down <coughs> and at a certain point <coughs> the aortic valve closes the aortic valve has now closed the atrioventricular valve is already closed so now the pressure in the ventricle drop, drops but the volume in the ventricle now remains constant whatever residual blood re remains inside the ventricle it just remains there so in a single stroke the ventricle is pushing out about 70 80 milliliters of of blood it's getting more blood in but only 70 80 milliliters of the 110 120 milliliters of blood coming in goes out and this ratio is called the ejection ratio normally about 50 to 60% in a healthy heart and that's a very if you look at uh, an echocardiogram that you receive it mentions the ejection ratio and so this is what it is so now when the aortic valve closes and the atrioventricular valve is already closed the volume uh, remains constant but the pressure in the ventricle drops so there are two phases which are isovolumetric constant volume constant volume the pressure suddenly changes in between there's a systole ejection of blood rapid injection of blood into the aorta everything happening because of a pressure gradient and bernoulli's principle is also at work here and you can measure velocities using doppler uh, ultrasound and so this is the entire picture that you get of pressure and volume variation so let me recap in the of course when blood is being ejected from the ventricle the volume of blood is falling down like an exponential graph so everything can be modeled mathematically as well so let's recap this blue curve is the volume of blood in the ventricle in the systole when blood is gushing out of the ventricle the volume of blood goes down it enters a constant isovolumetric relaxation phase and then it goes up in the diastole in two phases a rapid ingress followed by a diastasis and then atrial contraction takes place and there is another 20% extra blood that comes in all of a sudden the atrioventricular valve closes the aortic valve is all already closed so the volume remains constant but because of this qrs complex in the ecg there is a sudden increase in the in the ventricular pressure so this is the ventricular pressure graph goes up during systole remains con somewhat constant during diastole there's a hump because of the extra atrial contraction and then the process repeats if you look at the aortic uh, pressure the aortic pressure goes up in the systolic regime and then it droops in the diastolic regime and there is a notch here there is a slight notch here this is called the dicrotic notch now this notch happens when the aortic valve the valve here closes when the valve here closes it pushes back some of the blood that is already here it pushes on it just does a mechanical force on it which increases the pressure slightly so there is a kind of a backlash so all of their their valves acting here they are controlling the flow of uh, of blood and everything is happening in a rhythmic fashion it's not precisely periodic uh there is slight aperiodicity in in this cardiac rhythm which is a sign of health all right so by the way whenever a valve the atrioventricular valve closes you can also hear a sound <laughs>
And this is a sound that is generally used to detect blood pressure with a stethoscope. So there is a sequence of sounds when, an eight, when, an, when a valve closes. All right, these sounds are generally called carotid cough sounds, and they are used by nurses and doctors to find out blood pressure. So, any questions about this diagram? Yes, please. This one? This one? This one? So, the ventricle is being emptied of blood during systole. It's like a stroke of an engine. Blood is going out, so the volume is going down. However, this muscle is contracting. This muscle is contracting, and whatever blood remains in here sees a very high pressure. All right, so this pressure is going up. And when a T wave of the, uh, from the ECG is detected, the pressure starts going down. The muscle starts relaxing. So this is uh, the pressure inside the ventricles. Yes, please. So the action potential is the trigger here. That's of electrical origin. So that is creating this entire cycle. So this is an electromechanical system in a way. So if you would like to model this, this is an example of an electromechanical system in which there is a complex action potential, which is not a periodic signal. It, it, it's flowing through the muscles, muscles, muscular cells, and they are causing contractions and relaxations of the muscles, which is causing a change in the temporal change in the pressure and the volume. Now, I think you, yes, please. There are neurons spread out, there are fibers spread out, spread out. And in fact, an expert is sitting right next to us. Uh, Shahid Saab can actually elaborate on this a bit more. sinoatrial node and then there's a network of fibers uh, through which the action potential propagates there's a his bundle there's a Purkinje fibers so there's an entire network on the on on the heart so there's a network inside the whole body as well we're going to look at this electrical propagation the action potential uh, in the second module of this course GVO. There, there will be a slight phase difference because the electric potential takes time to travel from the right to the left. The sinoatrial node is somewhere here. So there has to be a small phase difference, only a few milliseconds. By the way, let's look at the pressures here. That's very important. If you look at the ventricular pressures, they go from about five, six millimeters of mercury all the way up to 120. So the, these are the pressures that we're talking about in the heart. And the heart cells the, that line the pericardium that are in that make up the walls, they have to sustain this much pressure. And the sheer talk uh, stresses that are brought about by these pressures. In the aorta, however, the pressure difference between the systolic and the so called diastolic pressure is about 40 millimeters of mercury between 120 and 80. So these are the pressures that we measure in an artery. And we're going to do this today in the class. All right, so, so look at the scales of the pressures, look at the scales of the volumes. So when the end of systole happens and the ventricle is emptied, still about 40, 50 milliliters of, water, uh, of blood remains inside the ventricles. And when 
the uh, end of the diastolic period happens, the volume of blood is about 130 ml. Right? So in a particular stroke, in one stroke, 130 minus 50, which is about 70, 80 milliliters of blood is pumped out of the heart. The heart has about, the body has about five and a half liters of blood. So all of this is in a, in a network and there are pulses of pressure that are emanating from the heart into the entire circulatory vasculature and blood is flowing. Now you can liken this since I'm an engineer and a physicist and this is a course with a physics code, <clears throat> we can liken this to an engine. Now this is a, a simple diesel engine. All right. Now, not to be, a, I'm not being very crude hearted here or cruel hearted, but this is very similar to what, what's happening inside an engine. So there is an intake, some uh, fuel comes in and then there is rapid compression this is the piston, there's a rapid compression which increases the temperature of the fluid. And at the same time, a spark plug is activated, which produces a large amounts of heat inside an exothermic combustion reaction. And finally, that extra pressure that is generated here is released through an exhaust system. Now, how do you model this? This is modeled by what is called, so any idea how, do, how you can model this? Adam, can you turn on the, sorry, lights are loud. So we want to make a phase diagram of the heart. We want to make a phase diagram of the engine. So one possibility is in a phase diagram, you have two variables. You need two variables. What are our variables of interest? Pressure and volume. So if I put pressure here and volume here, and I plot what happens during the entire cycle, the cardiac cycle or the cycle of the diesel engine, I will get a pressure volume diagram, which is also called a PV diagram. So if I look at this diesel engine here, uh, <clears throat> so let me first draw the diagram. So an approximate diagram looks like this. So let's call this point A. Let's call this point, oh, sorry, OA. OA is the intake of fuel. A to B, in, in going from A to B, there is a certain decrease in volume, right? And it's sudden, so this is a compression phase. Sudden decrease in volume. And this has to be really fast. So the time for go in going from A to B has to be really small and so small that energy exchange cannot take place. That energy cannot go in and it cannot go out. Such a process is called an adiabatic process. So A to B, is sudden compression. And as a result of sudden compression, the volume is going down, right? And the pressure is going up. In B to C, by the way, what's gonna to happen to the temperature here? The temperature is also increasing here. So the temperature is also going up, okay? Even though no 
internal energy is being added to the system. All the internal energy has been added between O and A. And this is not an energy transfer. This is a mass transfer. Fluid has come into the engine. So mass is, has been transported in O to A. A to B, the temperature goes up, sudden compression. And between B to C, there's a combustion reaction. The volume does not change, but the pressure and the temperature go really high. Okay, so this is B to C is ignition. If you would use the word engineer's light, this is ignition. This is where the combustion reaction is taking place and the pressure goes high, the temperature goes high. And now the pressure has gone up, the temperature has gone up from C to D we have a rapid expansion. Or this is where the pressure is dropping and, excuse me. In C to D, the volume is going up and the pressure is dropping. And this is what is called the stroke. And it's happening really fast. So this is where the engine is giving you mechanical energy. The piston is just expanding, it's going away. And in a very short period of time, no exchange of energy takes place and the engine is doing mechanical work, right? From A to B work is done on the engine and from C to D, the engine is doing work. So C to D is rapid expansion. So as a result of rapid expansion, the temperature goes down, the volume goes up of, of course, inside the cylinder of the engine, the volume goes up and the pressure has also dropped. Finally, from D to A, there is an exhaust process in which the volume remains uh, constant, but the pressure drops. In these regimes, energy is exchanged. So in this part, so energy goes in, here the energy goes out. So these are the two regimes where energy exchange with the environment is taking place. Anyway, this by the way is called the auto cycle. So there are other kinds of PV diagrams. You can make PV diagrams to express what happens to the thermodynamical state of a system. Now, if you look at And this graph here, is it possible to draw a PV diagram for this? Would anyone like to draw this PV diagram? So I just put, put the stuff over here, just to, I want a PV diagram for the heart, P, V. Can anyone attempt of making this diagram? We can start from, uh, let's start from here. We can start from anywhere. So remember, there are two regimes of isovolumetric expansion and compression. So this means I need to draw two lines, right? Two vertical lines. I'm drawing a very rough PV diagram. <clears throat> So at one point, this volume is going up, right? That's the diastole. So So let's call this point the end of diastole. Right. 
sorry, the end of systole. This point is the end of systole. When the ventricle has been emptied, volume is small. And now during diastole, volume is going up, right? So that's this region over here. The volume is going up. So at this point, let's call this the end of diastole. At the end of diastole, what's going to happen? This is a constant volume increase in pressure. So this is uh, the isovolumetric contraction, which is called the systole. And this causes an increase in the pressure, but the volume remains constant. At a particular point, the volume remains constant. When the aortic valve opens, blood is going to go out and the volume is going to decrease back again. So then you have to follow this part of the graph. The volume is going up and then it goes down. So at this point, I would like to draw something which is a mirror image of this graph, right? So at this point, the, eight, the uh, aortic valve opens. At this particular point, you enter the, uh, the you, you get this, you are at this stage. So this is where the atrioventricular valve closes. Uh, so, sorry. So this is, excuse me, AV opens. This is where AV, atrioventricular valve opens, atrioventricular valve closes. So this is the PV diagram that you would really like to have. Okay. So we can draw a PV diagram for the heart in exactly the same manner as an engine. So this, let's look at this point. Let's do it in a better fashion over here. <clears throat> Previous slide. Aortic, aortic valve is the one which leads into the aorta. So there's an aortic valve and, an, and a mitral valve, which is also called the atrioventricular valve, the valve between the atrium and the ventricle. All right, so I may have confused uh, you a little bit here. Let me see. So this is the atrioventricular valve closing, aortic valve opening, aortic valve closing, Exactly, this is what the real picture is. What's happening is that at the end of systole, so let's move back to this. At the end of systole, which is this point over here, this point over here, the volume of blood into the ventricle increases. The pressure hardly changes because ventricular contraction has not taken place. Then the atrioventricular valve closes the aortic valve is still closed, right? So, so you get this isovolumetric phase. The volume remains constant, but the pressure jumps up. At this point, the aortic valve opens and blood comes out of the ventricle. So the volume is decreasing. The pressure goes up a little bit and then decrease. So this hump is reflected, mirror imaged here. This cycle is going anti-clockwise. The diesel cycle was going on the, I think the other direction. That's fine. And then at this point, the atrioventricular valve closes. Uh, the AO. So this is, sorry, the 
the aortic valve closes. Sorry, the aortic valve closes. The atrioventricular valve is already closed. So this is an isovolumetric phase and the pressure drops. All right. So now looking at cardiomyopathies, diseases of the heart, one method would be to put in a catheter inside the ventricle, which has a pressure sensor and which does volume measurement, which can also be done by ultrasound and reproduce this graph, this PV diagram. And they do it for animals routinely. By the way, could anyone tell me what does this area represent? Volume? Work done. Exactly. So this represents work done. So if I have, say, a cylinder in which there is a piston, and I put a force on this piston, F, let's call this a small force, DF, and this moves by dx, then the minute amount of work that is done by this moving piston, of course, let's call this f by the way, sorry, is given by f dx, right? So, but force we know is pressure into area dx. And area into dx is the change in volume. All right. So pressure into the change in volume is equal to the amount of mechanical work done. Now here, if you start from this point A, go all the way from A to B to C to D and back to A in a loop. What you're really doing is doing a tiny bit of work here, tiny bit of work here, tiny bit of work here. So the, this phase you're doing some work, this phase you're doing work in the other direction. These two, BC and AD are the phases in which no mechanical work is being done because it's isovolumetric. And if you would like to look at the total work done, which has units of joules by the heart in a single cycle, what would you do? You would integrate. So in order to find the total energy, mechanical energy offered by the heart, expended by the heart, which is required to overcome vascular resistance so that blood flows through the entire circulatory system in a single beat is given by the integral of this entire curve all the way from A to B to C to D. And since it's a closed loop, mathematicians like to put a circle on this. This is a line integral, yes. But it gives the area under this graph. And there's going to be a homework problem that looks at this, all right? And you can find out how much energy is required, is used up by the heart in pumping blood in a single cycle. How much energy does it use in a minute? How much energy does it use in a heart, in a day? All right, so this is something you should be able to do on your own. By the way, now let's do a quick blood pressure measurement. But if you look at the screen over there, So in the aorta, the pressure goes between 80 and 120. In the large arteries, it's similar. Small arteries, it's similar, but then it drops down in the arterioles and the vasculature and the veins are at a very low pressure. There's very little of the pressure pulse that is going into the veins. But then on the pulmonary side, it goes up again. But the pulmonary and the left, the, the left side of the heart has much smaller pressure variations than the right, than the left side. The right has a smaller pressure variations than the right. All right, so now what I'm going to do is just need to, please excuse me, I just need to uh, figure out a few things and move the camera so that I can focus on something else. So this is for the recording. Here what I have is, what I would like to do now, I would like to look at the oscillations of pressure in real time in an artery, okay? So 
what we have over here is I put a cuff around my arm just above the elbow. And I, the cuff has air in it, of course. And the pressure is so large. It's larger than the oscillations. So it's beyond one, way, way beyond 120 millimeters of mercury. So what's going to happen is that it occludes or stops the flow of blood in the artery here and to the distal side of my arm because the external pressure that I apply is large. And then what happens is I slowly vent this pressure. I release this pressure slowly, slowly, slowly. At a particular point when the external pressure just is slightly above the maximum, the systolic pressure that one could observe in this artery, oscillations start to appear. And there is a sudden inflow of blood into the artery and the artery starts oscillating, right? And it starts oscillating quite vociferously, all right? Now, if I have some kind of sensor that can look at the pressure of the air inside the cuff, which is being transmitted by the artery to the connective tissue, I should be able to see the os oscillations of the artery, albeit in a damped fashion. So let me, uh, so I've made this system which actually does all of this. All right, so I will need a volunteer. Can you, can you please come here? I just wanna measure your, anyone? Yes, please. <clears throat> All right. So what I have to do is I have to start a program. So keep on looking, you can keep on looking on the screen. All right, so if you observe what's happening over here, I just need to move this to number three as well. Sorry, I have to focus on what is recorded as well. So here I have three graphs. This is the pressure in the cuff. All right, it's a, and it's uncalibrated. So it's in units of voltage. So I have a pressure sensor that is measuring pressure inside the cuff. And the output is in volts because I haven't calibrated it. And what I've done is I've looked at this signal and filtered it. So if there are any oscillations, I can look at the oscillations of the artery. So I have a circuit in between this graph and this graph so that I can look at the pure oscillations of an artery. This graph is by the way of a calibrated pressure sensor. All right, so there's units of uh, these units are tors, millimeters of mercury. Forget about this. It's pressures in millimeters of mercury. So what I expect, first of all, I would need to know what I expect. So it's always good to make a prediction before going ahead. What I expect is, this is time. This is my cuff pressure. I expect that I first inflate my cuff. I compress my cuff to say about 200 or 220 millimeters of mercury. I hope your blood pressure is not that high, but I would really like to make the pressure so high that the artery is occluded, is blocked. And then I put a valve in place, which bleeds the pressure slowly down, down, down. Okay. In the second graph, I want to look at the pressure oscillations in the artery. When the artery starts, blood starts flowing. So if I look at the cross section, this is my arm. This is an artery here. And this is my cuff, which has air inside. So this is my cuff. When blood flow is blocked here, there's a constant pressure here. But when blood starts to flow, it carries the pressure pulse. That pulse is transmitted 
through the connective tissue and it bumps onto this air cuff, which is constant volume. The volume is dropping so slow that at one time I can assume it has constant volume. When it bumps onto this cuff pressure, the pressure in the cuff goes up. So I expect at some point in time, when the pressure has gone down to some P naught, at that point in time, I expect oscillations to occur, which are indicative of the pressure oscillations in this artery. Right, so I get an oscillogram. And this third graph is simply a, a replica of this graph, but it's calibrated because I've used a particular kind of sensor and a circuit here. So it's going to be a replica of this graph and it's going to be calibrated. So this will be in millimeters of mercury here. And I might be able to see tiny oscillations riding on top of this. All right, so let's try, it and, doing, try and do this experiment and see if it works. All right, so here is our friend. What's your name? Talal. Hmm? Yeah? Here, here. Let's do it. आगे हो जाए डरना नहीं रन नहीं पड़ता ब्लड प्रेशर मेयर कर रहे हैं बाजू का जो डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन वक्त पे चलती नहीं है लेकिन लेट्स सी ऑल राइट सो वी मेड ऑल ऑफ दिस इन आर इन आर फिज लैब बाय द वे ऑल राइट सो Let's see. I'm going to clear the graph. Yes, the light off. Cut me, cut me, please. So that he will see the other side. Okay, I've cleared the graph. Okay, so I'm going to increase the pressure. थोड़ा सा आपको बोझ महसूस होगा. ठीक है क्योंकि लेकिन कोई ऐसी बड़ी बात नहीं. So the pressure is going to go up. ठीक है प्रेशर इज राइजिंग आई एम इन्फ्लेटिंग द कफ बट ठीक है नाउ देयर स्लो ब्लीडिंग ऑफ नाउ लुक एट द मिडिल ग्राफ राइट सो द प्रेशर इज गोइंग डाउन हियर स्लोली 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 इट्स वेंटिंग एट अ फ्यू मिलीमीटर्स ऑफ मर्क्री पर सेकंड राइट नाउ इट्स 140 मिलीमीटर्स ऑफ मर्क्री एट सम पॉइंट ऑसिलेशंस आर गोइंग टू कम अप सो दीस आर रिफ्लेक्टिव ऑफ द आर्टेरियल ऑसिलेशंस All right, just be patient, just a little bit. So the oscillations will grow in size because the external pressure has gone down, right? And then, as the diastolic point is approaching, the lower pressure value, these oscillations are going to die down. They are going to damp out a little bit. All right. So in order to save Talal from further obstruction, I'm going to vent the pressure quickly. ठीक है नाउ लेट्स लुक एट दिस ग्राफ सो यू आर डन आप काफ उतार दें सो इफ वी सो दिस इज आवर सॉफ्टवेयर फॉर आर सो दिस इज अ ज़ूम्ड आउट व्यू एग्जैक्टली व्हाट वी प्रेडिक्टेड वी कैन सी हियर इन रियल लाइफ दिस इज आवर कफ प्रेशर इन्फ्लेशन डिफ्लेशन स्लो डिफ्लेशन units of volts here the same thing in units of millimeters of mercury go going up coming down you might be able to see small oscillations here i can try to zooming this in a little bit let's first uh, let's turn off auto scale here so this is my uh, measurement from the calibrated pressure sensor these oscillations are visible in this particular graph but they're small enough so i made a circuit that does high pass filtering that catches on to this latches on to these oscillations per se and removes the slow frequency cuff pressure 
it's called a high pass filter and these are the oscillations so let me zoom in on to the oscillations now i turn off auto scale on my software here you are this point of the maximum size of oscillations is generally called the mean arterial pressure how blood pressure devices work they look at these oscillations they don't display the oscillations however there is an algorithm which is a closely guarded secret in the blood pressure manufacturers trade that looks at this oscillogram change of oscillations with time and from this oscillation oscillogram comes up with a blood pressure value for the systole and the diastole the higher and the lower pressure so one option is to use 40 50% of the maximum as a measure of the high end of the blood pressure the systole and use 30 40 or 20% or 50% of the downward slope as a measure of the low blood pressure there are other more sophisticated algorithms as well one is looking at this envelope and finding the maximum and the minimum of this envelope and by do, by doing some algorithm on this envelope finding out what the pressures are going to be so this could be one of your projects or one of your groups so i could give you lend this instrument to you you could take it home and write a computer program that analyzes these oscillograms and comes up with an algorithm to measure the mean arterial pressure the diastolic and the systolic pressure so this is one example of a project that you could do but the idea is that this human body is a living laboratory and with simple electronics simple instruments you can come up with with a lot of illuminating ideas all right so in the next lecture which will be the last lecture on the circulatory system we're going to look at some ideas in cardiac control all right thank you very much